A master of French surrealism, René Magritte combines a misleading sense of realism with a mocking irony. The disconcerting and irrational world of dreams collides with the placid surfaces of Magritte's canvases. The startling quality of Magritte's art originates from the artist's unusual use of otherwise common images. René François Ghislaine Magritte was born in Belgium in 1898, the son of a merchant. His mother died in 1912, drowned in the river one night. In 1913, he moved with his father and his two brothers to France in Charleroi, where he met Georgette Berger, his future wife. Registered at the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Brussels in 1916, the family moved back to Belgium. His first exhibition was in Brussels at the Galerie Le Centre Art in 1920. In 1922, he marries Georgette and earns his living by working as a designer for a wallpaper manufacturer and by drawing advertisements for fashion houses. The turning point of his artistic convictions becomes visible in 1925 and he's put under contract by the Galerie Le Centaur in Brussels in 1926. In 1927, he moved to Paris for three years before returning to Brussels. Nude, 1919. Portrait of Pierre Brutcoren, 1921. The Model, 1922. Georgette at the Piano, 1923. Self-Portrait Cubist, 1923. The Window, 1925. The Bather, 1925. The Blue Theater, 1925. Collage, 1926. Shadows of Shipwreck, 1926. Threshold of the Forest, 1926. The Lost Jockey, 1926. This work marks his break with Cubism and Futurism. Although Magritte would change the title and the setting, he repeated the theme of the jockey on a racehorse again and again over a span of almost 40 years. It first appeared during his years of imaginative investigation of the futurists, cubists, and other abstract artists. This version is important since it introduces theatrical elements, the curtains and the transposed winter woods with bilboquet cut from sheets of burlesque music. The entire middle section has been kept very bright, with a faint tracing of lines across the floor, the color changing as it moves upward to shades of blue. The bars of music contribute rhythmical transparency to the picture, in which the jockey theme becomes lost as though in some enchanted domain. Primiver, 1926. The Birth of the Idol, 1926. Magritte repeatedly depicted the jockey and especially the bilboquet and often added the form of the mannequin or dummy as here in The Birth of the Idol. In the storm above a tumultuous sea depicted here, Magritte displays an expressive power which rarely occurs later in his career. Although there are such elements as the blind staircase and the doors with openings in them, while the idol rises in the oppressive scene like an unattractive bilboquet dummy from the cut-out silhouette of a human being. The Difficult Journey, 1926. Popular Panorama, 1926. Magritte presents three strata here, which form a unit, yet are autonomous in regard to perspective. The two surfaces, with sawed, curvilinear edges, are simultaneously beach and woodland scenes, but they also suggest the materiality of wood, for example. Thus, the effect is that of a kind of magical box, where three aspects of landscape have been confined, but which has been sawed into so they can be visible. Through the superimposition of three elements in the painting, town, woods, sea, a simultaneity has been created, to which shortly afterward, in 1928-30, 
Magritte gave still greater emphasis in strangely framed fragments of these and other motifs. The tonal color, which has been applied very thinly, is a dull greenish gray, creating the rather oppressive and somber atmosphere typical of this period. Magritte's vision of trees, which fascinated him his whole life, is very important. What interested him here most are the trunks, squat, warped, powerful, lacking the tranquility they acquired in his late work. They shoot straight out of the surface without any roots. Untitled, 1926. Between 1925 and 1930, Magritte made limited use of collage by cutting up musical scores to introduce ambiguous elements into his works. Because of the shape of these elements, they remind one of both parts of musical instruments, such as the neck of a violin or cello, and of burlesque figures resembling marionettes, the creatures of modern fable, bilboquets and mannequins. De Chirico also employed rhythmical black dots, which Magritte too used now and then in the 1926 to 30 period. Magritte made something highly original of this by the imaginative use of musical notation. The evocation of music escapes no one. It causes everything to lose its heaviness. The World's Blood, 1926. From 1925 on, Magritte took two paths. The World's Blood shows organisms resembling legs and arms, which lack their extremities and have been skinned like those in pictures of anatomical lessons. The round forms, which they partly cover, are even more difficult to approach. The forms immediately behind the so-called flayed legs, for instance, may seem like certain phases in rock formation with signs of erosion. Magritte gives them artificial colors here, blood red and off-white. The Forest, 1926. Man of the Sea, 1926. The Oasis, 1925-27. Somewhere between 1925 and 1927, Magritte painted The Oasis, a simpler work with a title that is literal and presents no understanding problems at all. The small table on which the trees are standing, unreal trees consequently, is painted in Chinese perspective reversed and not systemized as in European Renaissance perspective. Magritte has altered spatial proportions here and shown that perspective is relative. The clouds appear partly in front of and partly behind the crowns of the trees, while the distance between the clouds and the ground is too small to be realistic. In the clouds, but not on them, is a bright light and the blue sky on the horizon changes color until it approaches deep midnight blue. Man with Newspaper, 1927. There is nothing disturbing about the surroundings of the man reading his newspaper. The stove appears to be of the catalog type once in fashion. The decoration on the wall is the most absurd and the most ordinary imaginable. The windows with the curtains the small bouquet of flowers on the windowsill, even the view, are exactly the kind the petty bourgeois selects to create the required atmosphere in his home. Magritte divides the canvas into four rectangles and paints the same little room four times, showing the man reading the newspaper in only one of these scenes. By being removed from the picture, the man becomes invisible. He does it three times, this repetition alone is sufficient and necessary to show that, despite the man's having disappeared, nothing essential has changed. His visibility had no meaning. His existence was empty. The Fast Hope, 1927. The Museum of One Night, 1927. The Pleasure, Young Women Eating a Bird, 1927. The Secret Player, 1927. The Invention of Life, 1927. The Symmetric Trick, 1928. The Six Elements, 
1928. The Six Elements shows fire, clouds, woods, a house, the bells on a horse's harness, and a female torso. The frame is Baroque in its fancifulness and irregularity, lending tension to the six fragments. The breasts, the luxuriant woods, the infernal fire, and the clouds in the blue sky all belong to the realm of nature. The bells evoke sound, and the fragment of a facade flanking the dreamy sky keeps the composition as a whole close to the earth. A house meant the center from which Magritte experienced the dialect between the inside and the outside, the finite and the infinite. Treachery of images, this is not a pipe, 1928. The false mirror, 1928, is a deliberate reduction of the natural function of an eye. The remarkable thing is that it does not actually look at us, the viewers of the work. Magritte avoids here the eye's active function, looking, by showing only its reflective function, the reflection in the cornea of the sky and clouds. The reflection in the mirror is passive, dead, but the reflection in the eye penetrates the interior, and it is there, inside the eye, that the image comes into being. The Empty Mask, 1928. Discovery, 1928. The title of the painting is clear. That which exists but had remained concealed and unknown is revealed. The apparent simplicity of various paintings belonging to this period is suddenly disturbed by the unexpected alteration here in the material of the skin of the naked figure. The grain of wood, which was an obsession with Magritte, appears here like a tattoo on the skin of the naked woman, making it even more sensual and adding both a somber and voluptuous quality to the painting. The Huntsman on the Edge of Night, 1928. In Magritte's Paris years, somber colors predominated, bronze, olive green, ochres, dark blue, brown, the wall here is blue-gray and luminous. The bodies of the huntsmen have clear, simple contours, and their hands are rough and broad, almost animalistic, like those of the figures in the Titanic days. Magritte's men are depicted with gestures of despair, groping in panic at a wall to find a way out. Although claustrophobia is not predominant in Magritte's work, it does appear occasionally, as in this example. Like the Titanic days, this painting has an element of drama and expressive gesture, which soon dwindled and did not occur again after 1930. The Regalia of the Storm, 1928. In 1928, Magritte's themes and titles often revealed a dynamic, violent, and somber emotion. The Regalia of the Storm contains the same boiling nocturnal sea we encounter in The Difficult Crossing and Birth of the Idol, viewed through fragments of an architecture that resembles stage scenery. This work is most like a theatrical scene. It includes cutouts, which in The Comic Spirit of 1927 are painted cutouts, but the painted cutout fragments of trees and leaves are of the same order flat phantoms, yet also figures in space. The regalia of the storm is, in spirit, a collage d'écoupage. The six personages appear firm. Thin and transparent as they are, they nonetheless cast shadows, and their ghostly, burlesque presence, between serious drama and comedy, is like the fine foam of the waves which blows across the beach in fanciful, nameless forms. The Cultivation of Ideas, 1928. In this poetic painting, which is an artificial landscape, two trees form a single crown of leaves. As a result, the two trunks, with short shadows falling before them, seem like the legs of a man walking into the landscape. Nature advances too, even coming up through the floor which consists of a cloud-like foreground with outlined forms, 
changing color only higher up to become wood with a distinct grain. The Voice of the Wind, 1928. The Mirror, A Life, 1928-29. The Scientific Tree, 1929. The Eternal Obviousness, 1930. The Surprising Answer, 1933. The Electives Affinities, 1933. The Key of the Field, 1933. The Collective Invention, 1934. The Empty Picture Frame, 1934. The work illustrated here seems to be a painting within a painting, which also shows us the wall of a room with a wainscot. There is scarcely any depth, only the wainscoting and the shadow of the frame. Thus, we are given no knowledge of distance, height, or breadth. The painting is not empty, however, but consists of a framed brick wall, so real and minutely detailed that we do not doubt that it is the outer wall of the gray inner wall. The cutting off of this wall without any foreground makes the room seem strange and vague. The simultaneous appearance of a fragmentary inner wall and a framed outer wall, all within a single picture, is the reason why the presence of the inner and outer wall within a single space seems absurd and ephemeral. The Rape, 1934. The Discovery of the Fire, 1934-35. Painted Plaster Mask, 1935. Here, Magritte has painted over the image of Napoleon's familiar death mask to create the impression of a blue sky with clouds. Thus, the mask has acquired a living quality, which makes it stranger than when it was merely dull plaster. Moreover, Magritte has added space to conjure up a sense of dimension. It is a genuine transformation, based on the juxtaposition of the real death mask with a recollection of a sky with clouds, which is no longer a recollection, since together with the mask, it forms a new poetic and spatial reality. Eternity, 1935. Magritte has summarized here the appearance and atmosphere of a museum in three pedestals and a restricting red cord strung on copper supports. In this work, he has not made the spatial element ambiguous, but has kept strictly to sensory reality and the illusionist method of painting. All he has done is to exhibit and isolate on the center pedestal a cylindrical lump of butter with a wooden spatula stuck into it, to which a number has been given, reminiscent of the way butter was formerly sold in Flanders. The lump of butter is flanked by an impressive bronze head of Christ and a head of Dante. The extraordinary feature of this work is the impressive and utter seriousness with which Magritte has painted the heads of Christ and Dante, as well as the butter. The Human Condition II, 1935. Although Magritte rarely gave us a complete landscape or figure, he almost always depicted as balustrade, a frame, a section of a wall, a windowsill. Magritte is always indoors, and from this vantage point, he looks out into the unknown, into space and into life outside, at the same time listening to it. Another peculiar feature is the manner in which Magritte makes the sea seem real on the canvas, and yet at the same time confers a transparency to it, which exists only in the mind, for the sea on the canvas conceals the sea outside and beyond. From the purely technical and abstract viewpoint, the thin white vertical stroke representing the edge of the canvas is exceptionally finely balanced against the horizontal lines of the sea, the waves, and the boundaries of the floor in the room. The dark sphere forms the center, despite the fact that it is placed left and below the actual center. It is formally related to the arch of the door and the delicate screws on the painter's easel. The Black Flag, 1936. 
Like Jules Verne, Magritte shows us the pilotless aircraft steered by invisible means. The theme is unique in his oeuvre. The first, and also the last, impression the painting makes on us is one of a threat hanging over the world. A flight of dark, mechanical birds, omens of the horrors Hitler and Mussolini were to let loose over Europe. Apparently intended seriously at first glance, on further inspection these constructions turn out to be playful objects that include a flying window complete with curtains. The color is somber, hard, and menacing, and the draftsmanship of the constructions is as simple as it is relentlessly accurate. Drawing, Portrait of Georgette Magritte, 1936. Self-Portrait, Perspicacity, 1936. This is a piece of cheese, 1936. The Red Model 2, 1937. Magritte painted the 1937 version while in London, and to give it an English trademark, he added a few English coins on the ground at the left. On the right is a torn scrap of newspaper, which, as an illustration, he incorporated the earlier theme, the Titanic Days of 1928. The metamorphosis of the shoes, which become bare feet on the gravel that is evidently sharp and painful to them, concentrates our attention on their ambivalence. They are both shoes and, at the same time, bare feet. Magritte has isolated these shoes' feet in such a way that they become provocative. In the painting here, together with the gravel, the unpainted planks with grained wood create a primitive, harsh, and rough sensation, notwithstanding the refinement of the brushwork and the color tones. The Forbidden Reproduction, Edward James's Portrait, 1937. The Principle of Pleasure, Edward James's Portrait, 1937. Homage to Max Sennett, 1937. The White Race, 1937. Meditation, 1937. The sky, the sea, and the beach together form a normal view of the coast, yet they differ from the 19th century marine painting by Delacroix, Courbet, or Daubigny, for instance, since in the almost midnight blue of the sea and the unnatural color of the beach particularly, Magritte has not kept to the appearance of things. His originality appears in the lower section of the work, where three lighted candles, which are also the heads of worms, curl their way across the beach. The conjunction of reptile and candle, so that they form a single organism, is as unexpected and strange as it is simple. The painting reveals the operation of the mechanism in the brain, which, guided by a capacity to discover relationships, succeeds in establishing relationships between images that are unconnected in nature. The Domain of Arnheim, 1, 1938. Beyond, 1938. Time Transfixed, 1938 or 1939. The painting is strong, simple, and convincing in conception. The stovepipe has been transformed without the slightest hesitation into a charging locomotive. The mirror, which is turned slightly to the front, two brass candelabra, the familiar black marble clock, and the oblique angle from which we view it all lend tension to the picture and an unusual impact. What looks like a joke amounts to a mental leap from chimney stovepipe coal stoking and smoke to the coal stoking and smoke of a locomotive. It is a leap from the external toward the internal world via comparison of two real objects. The Gradation of Fire, 1939. The Poetic World, 2, 1939. Each object, sky, clouds, window, door, block, the two slices of pâté, one standing, one lying flat, has been painted with complete realism. Each is powerfully present and aglow with color. 
There is no deformation except in the relationship between things, in space and in the proportions. The clouds transport us to space outside, although we are indoors observing the block with the pate, while the clouds inside the room are of proportions proper for a still life. Yet nothing surprises us because the antithesis of outdoors and indoors in this image has been transformed into a new order of being, light, and space, which can have been created only by the imagination. The unmistakable clarity and tension in the new scene before our eyes are achieved by the sublime blue, white, and deep gray, which together compose an intense and radiant light. Good Fortune, 1939. The good fortune illustrated here is an unusually fine and early solution to the problem of fusing night and day to form a single landscape. The delicately branched winter tree, set against a luminous sky with dark clouds, and the stars and crescent moon covering the houses, are linked to the sharp silhouettes of these houses, in whose windows gleam lamplight. Thus, in an apparently simple evening landscape, Magritte summarizes a wealth of experiences of light in three categories, which are separate and distinct in time. The House of Glass, 1939. The unexpected feature in The House of Glass is the sharp reversal of the face, which is looking at no one at all, and which is of an embarrassing reality. Penetrating through an opening in the skull and hair, it is not merely visible, but aggressive, as suggested by the open skull, the image comparable to a person breaking into his own house. Yet everything is painted with an absurd, meticulous mock realism, making visible simultaneously a front and rear view, whereas in the real world, the two views exist only as visible and invisible. In other words, the conjuring up of simultaneity evades the rules of three-dimensional representation, but at the same time, Magritte has preserved the method of painting expected for that kind of representation, which creates ambiguity. Poison, 1939. A cloud comes sailing into a room through the door, where it becomes an object casting a shadow on the wall. But the cloud also belongs to the sea and the sky outside, which are visible through the half-open door. There is an invisible observer. He might be a person supposed to be in the room who experiences this fusion of spaces, or the painter himself and the viewer of the work. The door shows an improbable change of color, beginning at the bottom with the color and grain of bare wood and changing higher up into a luminous, transparent blue that is the color of the sky above the sea outside. The result is that the natural scene outdoors and the room indoors merge into each other, transcending any spatial contradiction and losing their individual character. Nostalgy, 1940. The Wedding Breakfast, 1940. L'Ambelli, 1941. The Air Meadow, 1941. The Forbidden Universe, 1943. The First Day, 1943. The Fire, 1943. Flamme is Back, 1943. The Happy Presage, 1944. Natural Encounters, 1945. The experience of this painting can be like a strange encounter. First and foremost, there is the soft violet color of the wall's surface, which dominates the entire canvas, becoming warmer and deeper near the bottom in the floor and in the purple-red tones of the two odd mannequins. The cutoff at chest height of the two bilboquet mannequins and the absence of any converging lines creating perspective make it impossible to gauge the distance of the figures from the wall or the dimensions of the room. The wonderful feature of this canvas lies in the bright daylight of the real world beyond us, isolated and visible in a concentrated way within the rectangle of the upright window. 
Thus, the encounter is not between the two mannequins, nor between the viewer and the picture, but between the exterior and the interior worlds. The Brazier, 1945. Alice in the Wonderful Land, 1945. The Memory, 1945. Exciting Perfumes by Mem, 1946. The Stropiate, 1947. The Cicerone, 1947. The Pictural Content, 1947. The Triumphal March, 1947. Seasick, 1947. The Toupillon, 1947. The Psychologue, 1947. Pum, po pum, po pum, po pum, pum, 1947. Poster for the Festival of Beaux Arts, 1947. The Starvation, 1948. The Voice of the Blood, 1948. The Rainbow, 1948. The Charming Prince, 1948. The Ellipsis, 1948. Jean Marie, 1948. Halting Place, 1948. The Pebble, 1948. The Memory, 1948. The Legend of the Centuries, 1948. The Tears Flavor, 1948. The Crazy, 1948. The Drop of Water, 1948. The Rape, 1948. The Blood's Voice 1, 1948. The Blood's Voice 2, 1948. Perspective, The Balcony by Manet, 1949. What was it that induced Magritte to transform the famous painting by Manet of 1869, showing a balcony in Spain, occupied by Manet's charming lady friends and a portly gentleman, into a motif where the figures have been replaced or concealed by coffins. To Magritte, the coffin was an object which had irresistible appeal. The shock one receives on first seeing this work is of surprise that a painter should want to transform human figures into rigid, carefully executed forms of coffins. In other words, the spectator is confronted with the lugubrious idea of death and an obsession with the process of mortality. But in the perspective of mortality, the very charm of life becomes apparent. The Art of Conversation, 1950. Perspective, Madame Recamier de David, 1950. Recollection of Travels, 3, 1951. In this series, the process embraces the whole of life, descending upon it as the streams of lava once descended on Pompeii. In the recollection of travels, nothing has changed in the natural aspect of people and things except the materials they are made of. Because everything has become petrified, transfixed as in a monument, there is a terrible impression of all breathing having come to a stop. Here the word souvenir, which is a French word for recollection used in the title, a prominent component of all the works of the Romantic era, acquires an almost cynical and, in any case, ironical intonation. Personal Values, 1952. Magritte has changed the proportions between these objects to such an extent that between the smallest object in the real world, the match, and the largest pieces of furniture, the cupboard and the bed, they have almost been reversed. The comb has assumed gigantic proportions. The glass has become as tall as a human being. Moreover, one is able to imagine the walls of the room as transparent until one notices the shadow effect of one corner where the right wall meets the main wall. The cupboard on its left is also casting a shadow as well as the comb. In other words, the transparency is unreal. 
Self-Portrait with Four Arms, The Sorcerer, 1952. The Happy Hand, 1953. Golconde, 1953. The Seducer, 1953. The Night Dress, 1954. The Schoolmaster, 1954. The Empire of Light, 1954. Memory of a Voyage, 1955. Memory of a Voyage 3, 1955. The Maid Bouquet, 1956. Ignorant Fairy, 1956. September 16, 1957. In the work depicted here, Magritte has attained the immobility which makes it possible for him to experience form inwardly. Now, Magritte is the complete romantic who makes night seize upon the space occupied by the tree. He places the moon not above, beside, or behind the tree, but in front of it. And this is the one sign that shows us that we are not in the presence of a 19th century painter. The Hegel's Holidays, 1958. Harvest Month, 1959. The Glass Key, 1959. The Castle in the Pyrenees, 1959. To his vision of a castle on a rock floating above the sea, Magritte gave the title The Castle in the Pyrenees, apparently a play on the French expression Chateau en Espagne, equivalent to Castles in the Air. Magritte painted this work in blues, grays, and off-white, in that cool, finished manner by which he made the imaginary look real. The vision he must have had of the aerial journey of a castle on the cliffs emphasizes his close relationship to Edgar Allan Poe, who, in his story, Domain of Anaheim, has a massive structure of semi-Gothic architecture sustaining itself in mid-air, looming over everything. It is indeed the experience of living in mid-air that Magritte has evoked in his painting. The Touchy Chord, 1960. The God Wrath, 1960. The Tomb of the Wrestlers, 1960. Altering the normal dimensions of things was one of Magritte's ways of revitalizing spatial concepts. The relative proportion of objects changes to such an extent that the viewer of his works is forced to free himself from the bonds which the conventional presentation of things imposes and, by so doing, to experience them anew and more deeply. The marvelous thing about Magritte's rose is that it fills the room from floor to ceiling with its glowing sensuality without making the room absurdly small. In other words, as a presence in a room with its odor, color, and shape, a rose can be such a challenge to the viewer that it takes possession of his secret thoughts and emotions. As a result, an inner image of the rose emerges, which irresistibly absorbs the space it occupies without interfering with it. The Big Table, 1962. The Domain of Arnheim, 1962. The title of this work comes from Edgar Allan Poe's incomparable tale, The Domain of Arnheim, with its description of an imaginary landscape. He has transformed an undeniably grand impression of a moonlit mountain landscape, by means of a mental technique related to that of Poe, in which the natural phenomena have been retouched by the spiritual intervention of superior beings. Without the suggestions of Poe's story, Magritte might never have seen the eagle as an adjustment to, or a metamorphosis of, the line of mountain peaks, rising out of them and surveying the land. Nor might he have seen the three small eggs in the nest on the stone balustrade. A work which just avoids the pitfalls of kitsch, this is a landscape in which the sublime recollection of a moment of powerful emotion was painted scrupulously with a reticent adjusting touch. The Rosignol, 1962. 
The Beautiful World, 1962. Wasted Effort, 1962. On either side of the gray-blue plane of the stage, for that is what it is, stands two blue curtains, as partitions in the same space, in which they are not hanging and hardly ever standing, but simply existing, with a function all their own. In this orchestration, they are rather like the opening bars, a modest overture, leading to the main theme in the center. At the same time, Magritte gives his apparently simple canvas the complex function of opening up a prospect onto a natural interior world, sublime and with endless perspectives, by means of an artificial world. The curtains are essential for this purpose, for they link the outside world with the inside world in subtle gradations which are indispensable. Magritte establishes both the scene and the audience. Adventure Spirit, 1962. The Coeur de Schwange, 1963. The Big Family, 1963. Bottle with Label, 1937. Painted Bottle, 1963. Painted Bottle, 1950. The Joconde, 1964. The Great War, 1964. This is not an apple, 1964. The Beautiful Truths, 1964. Le Coeur des Schranges, 1964. The Spring, 1965. Signature in blank, 1965. Were it not for the horse and the elegant expressionless horsewoman, this canvas might seem like a normal summer woodland scene. But this too is an illusion, for between the dark leaves of the tree trunks in the foreground and the small trees, perhaps fruit trees, at the edge of the woods at the back, we notice on close scrutiny a curtain or backdrop behind the trees, foliage kept in pale tones of which it is difficult to say to what or to which trunks it actually belongs. Yet it is lively and attractive in its effect, taking the place of the sky and depriving the picture of depth. Magritte had the subtle and deceptive idea of having the horsewoman and her mount move in two planes. Between two trunks, the normal backdrop of foliage is visible, and this conceals a portion of the horse and reins, the horse appearing to be passing between the same two trunks. Spatially, the rider and the woods become an absurdity due to this section of the intruding background, the position of one of the horse's hind legs, and another tree trunk in the background, part of which passes in front of the horse and rider. The Frightening Top, 1966. The Two Mysteries, 1966. Drawing Room Philosophy, 1966. Collage, 1966. Bronze, The Natural Grace, 1967. Bronze, Madame Recamier, 1967. Bronze, The Alexander Task, 1967. Bronze, The Well of Trust, 1967. The White Race, 1967. The Art of Living, 1967. In the year he died, Magritte painted The Art of Living. It is composed of familiar features from his oeuvre, full-face portraits of ready-made citizens, decapitated and ranged in front of a stone balustrade against a background of mountains. And as so often in Magritte's works, there is also something new. Here an enormous pink balloon is floating above the decapitated body, and the balloon is the head. Inside the balloon is a very small complex of eyes, nose, mouth, which seems mysterious, yet is not, for it is the expression of normalized vacuity, like the ready-made suit, which nevertheless represents a human being 
and hides everything that must remain secret. The small sins which convention prescribes, the major sins which society forbids. The fascinating and challenging images in Magritte's works stem from revelations of the mystery of the visible world. René Magritte died in 1967. To him, this world was a more than adequate source of lucid revelations. <laughs>